Hey folks, it's Nate. Thanks for joining me at the art table again today. I wanted to talk a little bit about the do-it-yourself mentality. And I think overall, it is a very healthy attitude to have. This goes double for creative types of people, who will often run into roadblocks that can only be overcome with a little bit of know-how and a lot of willingness to pitch in yourself. Do you have a piece of set that needs painting? You're probably the best person to do that. Want to get your comic lettered? There's a lot of good software that will let you do that on your own much cheaper than hiring someone. There are many, many elements of a creative endeavor that don't really require the level of professionalism we see coming out of mainstream entertainment. It's not bad to have it, don't get me wrong. And if you can find it, or if you have it already, don't be afraid to go full bore on it. But, most of the time, if your typesetting in your comic is a little bit below par, no one is going to complain too much so long as the art is very good. You want to put your emphasis on the primary things and not sweat the secondary things too much. If you find that you are getting the highest level of quality out of your secondary things, see if you can make that your primary thing. If you're a better artist than a writer, for example, a comic with a simple story but lots of opportunities for great vistas or close examinations of a character's expression or attitude, these are the kinds of stories that will suit you better than a very complicated Game of Thrones-esque plot. Having said all this, as you can probably tell by the title of this video, today we are concerned about the things that you cannot do yourself. Now, very often in the indie scene, you will be told to go out and do it yourself if you think you need help with something, and it's not surprising why. You can't expect a lot of support when you are working independently. That's just the nature of the gig, unfortunately. However, there are some areas where going out and trying to do it yourself is going to detract from your efforts rather than add to them. To cite an example of this, in my own case, I try to avoid using music in my projects because I'm not a very good musician. Now, I can play music. I studied music for about 12 years, and I got competent enough that if you gave me a sheet of music to play on my cello, which was my instrument, I could certainly do it. In fact, I have performed several pieces of music that are considered rather challenging. But I don't really have an understanding of music. I can't compose it. I can't pick it out by ear. I need a sheet of music in front of me with a lot of time to practice before I can make anything like real music using my cello. Or at least I did. I haven't actually played it for several years, so I would have to go back and dust it off and then retrain myself back up to a level of something like competence before I could really expect to perform well on it. I certainly couldn't pick up something like the guitar and teach myself to play that, or even learn to play it using a couple of instructional videos. I don't have the right temperament for it. I'm not very interested in learning that set of skills either. So if I was interested in adding music to one of my projects, I would have to find someone else to produce that music for me. This is a weakness of mine, and it is a weakness I would not try and solve on my own. It would take away too much time from my other creative projects, and it would be very frustrating with a very poor return on investment. So yes, while it is important to have an attitude of I will do as much as I can by myself, it is also very important to recognize these kinds of weak points in your skill set and to assess the kind of return on investment you're going to get if you pursue them on your own. I don't find comic typesetting very interesting either, but it's much easier to do and I have a better intuitive grasp of the principles that underlie it, so I think it is a skill set that I could develop on my own, unlike producing my own music as an intro for these videos, or for, say, a trailer that I am putting on a comic project. A great mainstream example of this comes from the Marvel series She-Hulk, which ended just a couple of weeks ago. It is the universal opinion of people who have seen this TV show that the writers did not know anything about the law, even though the main character is a lawyer and is in the courtroom several times. We've heard this from the perspective of people who have been in the courtroom as plaintiffs and as defendants. We've heard this from lawyers who have analyzed the courtroom scenes from their professional point of view. And we've heard it from the writers themselves, who admit that they didn't know anything about the law, and they don't seem to have brought in a legal consultant, either. 
The defense usually offered for this is that the writers were creating a comedy and not a legal drama. And the legal intricacies of filing paperwork for the court or making proper motion practice would be unfunny. Now, this is not true. There have been several hilarious stories told about courtrooms, bureaucracy, and all of the attendant trappings that go along with both of these lines of work. But more than that, it's lazy. You could create a hilarious story about a courtroom that is bizarre and surreal and departs so wildly from reality that nothing that happens in it makes sense in hilarious ways. Pushing a legal story to its limits has a lot of potential for black comedy. Alternatively, a legal drama can be highly satirical, making fun of things that actually happen in the courtroom through the lens of superheroes, which is, of course, the shtick of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, in order to make fun of the absurdities of our existing legal system. However, in order to do that, you would have to be very knowledgeable about the existing legal system. The legal element of She-Hulk attempts to do none of these things. Instead, it tries to look at superheroes through the lens of American law, except they get all of the American law incorrect. The quintessential example of this is when we see She-Hulk lose a case about a set of exploding rocket boots because she didn't bother to do the least bit of research into the kinds of legal warnings and proper usage of the rocket boots and interrogate her client about whether he had followed those directions. As a result, She-Hulk looks incompetent and stupid, which would be fine if this was a joke at Jen's expense, but it is not. The show intends us to take her as a serious lawyer throughout all of this, because all of the characters treat her as a serious lawyer in this episode. The result is a story that does not make sense in tone, in theme, or in the actual events of the story. All because the writers thought they could do it themselves and didn't bother to ask anyone for help. Again, it is important to be as independent as possible when you are an independent writer. But when you come across these things that require a great deal of expertise in order to function properly in your narrative, it is far, far better to ask and even pay for someone to help you get the details right than it is to try and muddle through them on your own. At the heart of this, there is an important lesson. Know yourself Know your capabilities, know your story, know what it requires from you, and then, and only then, can you evaluate what you need to ask for help with and what you can handle on your own. Once you understand these things, you can decide what you're going to do yourself, what you can kind of hand wave away, and what you need to ask for help with. Developing this skill set is going to be one of the most important things we can do as we attempt to save storytelling. Anyway, that's all I've got for you today. Let me know what you think down in the comments below. There's a like button and a subscribe button down there. You can use those as you see fit, and I'll talk to you later.